good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for these opportunities that we have together. Uh, we're always thankful for the opportunities we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. You know, there's many cases that can be made for God's existence without using the Bible, but the Bible, I think, is one of the most powerful tools when it comes to proving that God does exist. And the Bible is such an applicable tool to our lives today, despite what our society says so many times as the Bible being an outdated book. I suggest to you that the Bible is one the, the most amazing book of all time. And, and you start to think about the book and, and, and the Bible, and you start thinking about what God has said about the Bible. God says the Bible is inspired. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God has inspired the book. And then we go, go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It tells us, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There is something special about this book. The book that we have before us bears characteristics. It, it, it has uh, things about it that are special. And why would it not if it is, in fact, a book from God? There are four areas, and this lesson might be a little different than, than lessons that you've, you've heard before, but this book is special. It is, it is so special. It is a book from God. And, and the way that I kind of put it sometimes when I talk to individuals, as I say, if God tried to communicate to man in some way, wouldn't it have to be perfect? I mean, wouldn't it have to be flawless? Wouldn't it have to be accurate in all ways? And I think they answer yes. But then when you start to show them that the Bible actually fulfills that promise, a lot of times they are amazed. I remember one individual I was having a conversation with when I was in college. This young lady, she, uh, she found out some of my beliefs about some things, and, and she wanted to have a conversation. Well, her conversation was pretty one-sided. I said, please, just give me a few minutes. You know, Just give me a few minutes. I said, if God tried to communicate with us, wouldn't he have to communicate in a perfect way? She said, yes. I said, if he gave us a book, for instance, wouldn't it have to be perfect in all areas? And her answer was yes. I said, well, let's look at the book then. Let's look at the inspired word of God and see if it's actually what it says it is. You know, you start to think about the Bible, 66 books written over a period of 1,600 years by 40 different individuals. I mean, what we have before us just by saying that alone is something very special. 66 books over a period of 1,600 years, written by 40 different individuals. I mean, that alone is amazing. But it certainly goes on beyond that. How could we tell if a, a book was from God? I'd say it'd have to be accurate. It'd have to be perfect. And certainly there are four areas which we're going to consider this morning, which are really what I would say are the pillars of inspiration. If a book came from God, if it said anything about history, wouldn't it have to be accurate? I'd say yes. I mean, if a book is coming from God, by God, if it says something about history, wouldn't that be accurate? Not only history, but geography. If it says something about a plain or it says something about a river or a mountain, wouldn't we have to say that all that would have to be accurate? If the Bible said something about science, wouldn't it have to be accurate? If the Bible predicted something, wouldn't it have to be accurate? And these really are the pillars of inspiration. You know, many people have come after this book and attacked it year after year after year. But really, when you dig down and look at it, it is one of the most amazing books. It is the most amazing book that we have. The book that we have before us is reliable and credible. It has been right over and over and over again. And if we take just a few moments to reflect on that today, I think that would put us in a good place. Because if this is the inspired word of God and it has come from God, certainly its instructions are applicable to us in all areas. Not only in worship, but also when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the conduct in our lives. One of the pillars, I, I believe, in, of inspiration is the historical accuracy of the Bible. Is when the Bible says something about history, it is accurate. It's not that the Bible is supposed to be a history book, per se. The Bible is supposed to teach us about Jesus, the good news about Jesus. But certainly when the Bible says something about history... It is accurate when it comes to those things. When it comes to major characters in the Bible, they are not major characters as we would discuss in like some, some made-up story. These are characters that we can see their lives unfold and we can verify that these people lived. You know, you think about Jesus. There, there's, there's few things that irritate me quite more than when people say Jesus didn't exist. 
I mean, I mean, if there was anyone that existed, I feel like it almost has to be Jesus. I mean, we have this whole book almost dedicated to Jesus. And not only do we have this book, because people say, well, this book's got to be biased, you know, because it's for Jesus. But we have other people that write about Jesus. And then you think about across the world and how much Jesus has had an impact. I mean, almost everyone at least has heard that name before. But you think about it, it's not just this book. But history really takes us to this. Uh, If you consider Josephus for a moment, Josephus was a Jewish historian. He was not a fan of Jesus at all. And you don't have to read the uh, text on the board. It's really just there for my notes to just kind of remind me. But Josephus, he talks about Jesus. Around 70 AD, he writes back and he talks about Jesus. This is not the Bible. Josephus was not a fan of Jesus, but yet he writes about Jesus. He calls him out. And actually, even in his writings, he says, there is a Jew, Jesus, who is deceiving many Gentiles. He's leading them astray. Josephus was not a fan of Jesus, but he wrote about Jesus. So when the Bible writes about somebody in the Bible, if we cannot find necessarily documentation, I mean, the Bible, where it can be verified, it's verified. Are there people mentioned in the Bible that we cannot find historical records of? Of course. But when the Bible starts talking about people, when it starts talking about names, when it starts talking about places, when it starts talking about events, we can find from the world, not from this book, but uh, from other places, saying the same thing that the Bible says over and over again. Tacitus was also a historian that also wrote about Jesus, discussing uh, some of the things that he had done, some things that his followers believed. But these are two individuals that were not allies to the Bible. We're not allies to Jesus, but yet they write about Jesus. Why? Because he's a real person. People are really unfair when they come to history many times. Uh, you know, Jesus has more documentation, more verification, more uh, people talking about him than probably any other figure in history, but yet somehow people get away with saying, oh, that Jesus, he just didn't even exist. What? That's crazy. In fact, I went all the way with an individual having a discussion about this, and the individual went to the case. They went so far that, okay, uh, it doesn't matter if people write about somebody. You know, it doesn't matter if they write about them. It doesn't matter if they talk about them. And they got to the point where basically they denounced any history that they didn't have a photograph for. They just said, I can't believe it. You know, if it doesn't have a picture, then I can't believe it. It's really amazing when you think about it. Uh, This individual is being trained to be a teacher, so really they're going to teach a whole bunch of things in a classroom that don't have photographic evidence that they're going to teach, and they're going to say, yeah, I believe this, but they won't believe in Jesus. Why? Because they don't want to. There are more people that have written about Jesus, talked about his life. They didn't agree with him always, but there is tons of historical evidence. But it goes deeper than that because the Bible starts writing details that it doesn't have to write details about. It writes details about leaders, about nations, about all these different groups and how they're interacting. You think about Pontius Pilate. You know, for a long time, Pontius Pilate was one thing that they would always use against Christians many times. But uh, in 1963, they found a stone. And the stone has inscribed on it Pontius Pilate. I mean, just as clear as day. And not only that, we can go over to other historical writings that write about Pontius Pilate. Well, what's the point? Is when the Bible talks about Jesus, Jesus was a person. When, they talk, when the Bible talks about Pilate, Pilate was a person. And it's not just the Bible. You can go back into the world. You can read the historical documents from the world. People that were not friends of Jesus. That didn't want to verify his case. But how can you not write about this individual that is doing all these things and changing the world? And really, that's the problem that the world has is when the Bible starts talking about people, events, when it starts talking about things, they happened. And they can be verified multiple different ways. You know, this is one of those one lessons where you just keep going and going and going. The Bible talks about Pontius Pilate. And what do we find in the historical record? We find a Pontius Pilate. We can go on and on and on. King David was one that they brought up for years and years. And they said, we can't find records of this King David. We can't find records of this King David. Well, in 1993, they dug up a stone uh, in the Israelite city of Dan, and the stone mentions the lineage of David, and it talks about a king from the lineage of David. They said, oh, oh the Bible talks about King David, but, but we don't see anything in history. Well, then we dig up a stone. And I'm not saying that we have to do this for every single thing in the Bible, 
But it is, it puts you in a hard place when you're a critic of the Bible and you say, oh, it's just a book of fairy tales. But yet, when it talks about Jesus and we go and we have all these writers writing about Jesus. When the Bible talks about Pontius Pilate and we have all this documentation of Pontius Pilate. And when the Bible talks about King David and we can go back and we can find these things. Do we have to verify every single thing? No. But every time there's a chance to verify, it's verified. There is nothing when it comes to the Bible that it says, oh, there was this, this, this figure. I mean, we can't even make it up. You know, the Bible talks about this king that was king of this land during this time, and then we find some historical evidence that says, no, he wasn't the king at the time. It always is verifying. It is always supporting. And like I said, we're just kind of going through this very quickly. When we're talking about history, this is something that you could have Bible study on for half a year. Half a year, and this is just one of the pillars of inspiration. Kyle, why do you believe the Bible? Because the Bible is a historical document. It is telling us about these individuals, and you just don't have to take the Bible alone. You can look at these other areas. Hezekiah's tunnel. I mean, you you think about that. The Bible records in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings 20.20, and 2 Chronicles, it talks about King Hezekiah building this tunnel. He builds this tunnel. He constructs this tunnel. The Bible talks about it. It talks about him. It talks about the tunnel. And then all of a sudden, we go over there and we start digging. Guess what we find? Hezekiah's tunnel. What are the odds? People are just digging random tunnels everywhere. No, the Bible told us what happened. The Bible told us that Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, dug this tunnel. And what do we find when we go over and we dig in those locations? We find what the Bible said happened. What was there? The Bible is reliable. The Bible is credible. The Bible has proven itself over and over and over again. In fact, if we stay in this area in history, we're going to get in trouble. Because as time goes on, I almost feel like the Bible is getting more supported. As the years go on, as we do more digs, as we read more documents, as we uncover more, there is more and more and more that is supporting the historical book we have here. Now, was the Bible written to be historical? Not necessarily. It was written about the good news of Jesus and to get us from the past to the present when it comes to Jesus. But it's a book from God. We could talk about all these individually, but we don't necessarily have the time. But Taylor's prison was found in 1830. Uh, You know, Nineveh, uh, Sennacherib. You know, Sennacherib's an outside source, but Sennacherib attacked Israel many times. He sieged 46 cities. Interesting enough, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, that's kind of what the Bible says, is Sennacherib comes into Israel and he's sieging 46 cities. You know, you start digging through this and it's really amazing. As the Bible says, hey, Sennacherib's attacking us. We find Sennacherib stuff and you know what he says? I was attacking the Israelites. See, it's so hard. Because you try to delete some things out of the Bible, it just gets ridiculous. Are you really going to delete the Israelites out of the Bible? Is that what you're going to do? Delete that whole family out of the Middle East? It's impossible. If you, if you uh, delete the Israelites out of the Bible, what happens is you kind of delete the Babylonians, and you d- delete Sennacherib, and you delete the Assyrians, and you delete all these other groups, because all these groups interacted with the Israelites. They fought with them. They traded with them. It's impossible to delete. We could go on and on and on. The Bible talks about the king of Babylon. Guess what we find in the historical record? A king of Babylon. It talks about the walls of Babylon and describes them. We dig up the walls. We see what they were like. We read documents about them. When the Bible says something historically, it's been validated every time. Now sometimes there are things said about people that we haven't found anything on. But it's never been in the negative. It has never been the Bible says that this was the king of Babylon, and then we dig up a document, and it's like, actually, that wasn't the king of Babylon. It's always the Bible tells us something historically, and when we dig, when we research, when we find, it's always validating the Bible. Over and over and over again. And like I said, I don't have time to talk about all these, but uh, we have the Moabite stone, snack ribs, wall. We have all these things. And when you read these, they match up with the Bible. Now, there are certain instances where it perhaps wouldn't match up with the Bible, and one of those is when it talks about Sennacherib, is that King Hezekiah prays to God, and the Bible accounts that he is rescued by uh, by an army, and that basically his army is destroyed. And, of course, he doesn't record that. Well, why would he record one of the biggest defeats of his life? He's not going to record that. But what does he record? He records a sieging 46 cities in Jerusalem, and we can read that in the Bible. 
one of the pillars of the Bible is is historically accurate. If you take this book and you apply it to other religious books, like why don't you believe this book? Why don't you believe this book? Because this book is historically accurate. You know? Why, why, why don't you align yourselves to this book? Why don't you align yourself to this? this book is perfect when it comes to its historical documentation. It is accurate over and over again. And really, if people would just sit down and they would consider this one area alone, it would take them a long way. Like I said, you could spend months, years studying this area alone. And this is one of the pillars of the Bible. Find one instance where the Bible mentions something historically and you try to find it and you are going to find validating evidence every time. Another area that many times people don't separate but I think is a pillar when it comes to the Bible is the Bible's accurate when it comes to geography. When the Bible talks about a river, when it talks about a mountain, when it talks about anything geography related, it is there every single time. In fact, there's a gentleman, William Ramsey, who wasn't a big fan of the Bible. He said, I'm going to prove the Bible wrong. And really, I'm going to prove it wrong in relation to geography was his primary concern, although he kind of gets into history as well. He goes over to the Middle East and he says, I am going to walk where they walked. I'm going to see if the Sea of Galilee is there. I'm going to see if the Jordan's there. I'm going to see if these mountains are there. And when he goes there, he has a couple quotes that I pulled from his writings. He said, further study shows that the book could bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority for the facts of the Aegean world and that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and uh, perception of truth as to be a model of a historical statement. When Ramsey went over there, he went over there to prove the Bible wrong. He said, I'm going to prove this wrong. How could all of this writing be accurate? Yet he goes over there, he starts walking, he's like, hey, the Sea of Galilee's here. (laughs) The Jordan River's here. The island of Cyprus is here. All these cities are here. And he starts studying, he starts looking into it, and he's like, it's accurate. In fact, he has another statement that I like. He says, you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians. Of course, Luke, you know, writing many, uh, you know, writing the New Testament in terms of Acts and some of those, But we're looking at, he he is looking at this and he says, is it accurate? When I walk here, do I see this? When I walk here, do I see this? And he says it's accurate over and over again. And this might not seem like a lot, but I can point you to some other religious books that they name some towns that you can find no record of. They name some rivers that you can find no record of. They name mountains that you can find no record of. When the Bible talks about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is a place. You can go over to Jerusalem. When it talks about the Jordan River, you can go see the Jordan River. Other religious books, they'll mention rivers we can't find. We can't find documentation. We can't find writings. It's like they just made it up. This can be verified. And that's what Ramsey did as he went over and he started finding things. He's like, hey, there's the Jordan River. What does the Bible talk about? The Jordan River. It talks about John the Baptist and the Jordan River. It talks about the Israelites crossing the Jordan River. The Jordan River's there. It's not a made-up story. It's not made-up writings. And we continue on the Sea of Galilee. And like I said, geography, if you just want to study geography in the Bible, it would take you, you know, your whole lifetime. If you go through everything in here, you're going to, and you go over, you're going to find the cities. You're going to find documentation. You're going to find the rivers and all these things. The city of Jericho. You know, I mean, the Bible says there's a city of Jericho. And guess what we found? We found the walls of the city of Jericho. Other religious texts don't do that. And I know that sometimes we don't look at other religious texts. We don't spend a lot of time with other religious texts. But they don't bear the same. If you compare them side by side and you say, I'm going to look at what the Bible says historically. And I'm going to look what this book says historically. The Bible's going to beat it. When you say, let's look at what this book says about geography and what the Bible says. The Bible's going to win. It's going to win every single time. And many times people would not think about this, but the Bible came from God. It better be historically accurate. The Bible came from God. The geography better be accurate. When it talks about a mountain, when it talks about a river, when it talks about any of these things, it better be accurate, and it is. You know, it starts to put people that are critics of the Bible in a hard place because you start to realize, find the error. And actually, that's a suggestion that I've made to, because of, because of my job, I get put in different things. You know, I work at a college, you know, one of the more liberal places sometimes. But, but sometimes they'll, they'll, you know, they, uh, let's just say I'm not their, they're not my biggest fan. <laughs> they're not the biggest fan of me. Okay? And they'll pick, you know. They'll say, oh, oh that Bible. And I'll say, where's the, where's the problem with the history? You, you pick out the person that didn't really exist. You pick out 
the river that didn't really exist. You pick out that, and you start realizing that this is an amazing and perfect book. And I can tell you, when you go to the bookstore at the college, you know how many revisions are on their history books? There's one. It's got 36 revisions. 36 editions. They go back into the book and go, oh, we made a mistake. Now, a lot of times are those typos, yes. And a lot of times are, this has had no changes. This has had no changes. Well, Kyle, prove it. Well, we can go back to the Gutenberg printing press. <laughs> that does exact copies. And then beyond that, we can go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we can read the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we can see if that matches what we have. This book has not changed. And yet man will put their nose up at it and say, we've got a better book. You don't have a better book than this. It's historically accurate. The geography is accurate. It is an amazing book. It is like no other book. It doesn't need revisions. It doesn't need updates. It doesn't need changes. The Bible is inspired. Like I said, we kind of covered two pillars. Each of these pillars could be studied for years, and there are people far better that could discuss this with you than me. You know, brothers and sisters in Christ that have dedicated their life to studying just one area. History is a pillar of the inspiration of the Bible. The Bible is historically accurate. Another pillar of the inspiration of the Bible is its geography. When it talks about a mountain, a river, a valley, a city, those places were there. But another pillar of the Bible's inspiration is its scientific foreknowledge. What scientific foreknowledge is the Bible says something far before its time. Before it was formally discovered, before it was formally documented, before it was put in a textbook, the Bible said it before it was discovered. Things were written in the Bible that were simply, would have simply been unknown to the people that were writing at the time. So let's discuss some of those really quickly. In Leviticus chapter 17 verses 11 through 14, it talks about the life being in the blood. Now, sometimes you've got to be careful with these, but, I, I, but we'll look through each one, and there's just going to be so many that it's just going to pound up, and it's just going to be you know, to the point where you're like, I'm just overwhelmed. But you know, we didn't always think the life was in the blood. In fact, if you look back on George Washington, what they did is they said he actually had bad blood. So what they did is they put leeches on him, and he died of probably complications of that after. I mean, this is kind of a recent thing where we actually thought that the life is tied to our blood. But you think about it, if you die, it's going to be tied, connected to your blood. You know, a blood clot, heart attack, uh, if you bleed out, if you drown, actually what's happening is you're not getting oxygen into your lungs, and your lungs puts that, uh, the, uh, the oxygen goes into your blood from the lungs. So if you drown, I mean, it's kind of a blood issue, is your blood is not carrying oxygen to your body. So when you die, it's probably going to be blood related to some degree. The Bible says life of the flesh is in the blood. I said that a long time ago. How did they know that? How did they know that? And you're like, okay, coincidence. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> coincidence, that's what they like to say. Well, we keep going, and it's just going to get ridiculous. I mean, the Bible is just going to show itself to be an amazing book over and over again. You think about circumcision. Circumcision mentioned in Genesis chapter 17 and verse 12 is supposed to be on what day? It's supposed to be on the eighth day. Take your male children. You're going to circumcise them. Do a surgery on them. Okay? Why the eighth day? You know, Abraham didn't ask any questions. He was a man of faith. God says it, I'm going to do it. I don't need to know all the details. Well, now as we fast forward so many years, we did, we've done some research, we found out some things. The eighth day is when vitamin K peaks in your body. And when, when that peaks in your body, uh, prothrobin also peaks in your body. And I know you probably can't see the graph, but day one, it's not a good day to do surgery. You have none of that hardly. Then day two, it starts to rise, and I know you probably can't see the chart, but day eight is when it peaks. Well, what happens when you have vitamin K in this prothrombin? What it does is it helps your blood to clot. So if you get cut, you know, you'll bleed in the blood, will, you know, but if you are high in vitamin K, if you get cut, the blood will just kind of stay there right on your arm. It'll start clotting a lot quicker. The eighth day is the perfect day to do a surgery. We say, wait, my child, I think when they circumcise them, if they were circumcised, your, your male children, they did it at the hospital on day one. Well, what they do is they give you a shot of vitamin K. That's what they do to your child. They give them a shot of vitamin K. They know what helps the blood clotting. In fact, if you do surgeries, a lot of times they have vitamin K on standby because they know what it can do is it can clot the blood. How would they know this? How did they write this? Why not day one? Why not day two? Why not day three? Are they really that lucky to guess day eight? Really? That lucky? And that's what people try to say. They're, oh, they're just getting lucky. Day eight, really? How did, how did they do that? How did they experiment? They're like, this, this, this test group we're going to do on day one, this test group we're going to do on day two, this test group... No! Because God was the writer. God was the one that inspired the book. The eighth day is the perfect day to do a surgery. 
of, of that magnitude won such a circumcision. How did they know that? They had no way of knowing it unless God was helping them. You know, you think about dinosaurs, I don't think people think about that. See, see, when you're thinking about these, you have to put yourself back when this was written, which is extremely hard to do because a lot of this was written thousands of years ago. So you kind of have to put yourself in the shoes of the writer. How did the writer know this when they were writing it? And the answer is, is there was no way they could. In Job chapter 40, verses 15 through 24, it, it discusses this creature called the behemoth. And it talks about it having a huge tail that swings like a cedar. Really, there, there is no animal on the planet that really matches that description. A tail that swings like a cedar. You know what it does really match up with? Dinosaurs. We say, well, why didn't the Bible use the word dinosaur? Because dinosaur, that word was invented when they started discovering these bones. When did they start discovering these bones? In the 1600s. So you think about it. The writers of the Bible are writing about these huge, massive creatures... And no one sees them. And then the 1600s, we start digging up these bones. And then we're like, whoa, what are these bones? What's going on here? And then all along, the Bible is writing about huge, massive creatures. The behemoth, Leviathan. You start looking at these things. The Bible wrote about this. How did, the Bible, how did these people know that there are these huge creatures roaming around the world? Did they find the bones? We found the bones in the 1600s. How could they write about such a thing? Because God told them what to write. And perhaps in many cases, they walked with them. I mean, that's not out of the question. But also you think about fossils. I don't think people think about fossils. It takes a very special process to make a fossil. Because if a deer dies out beside the road, what happens to it? All the scavengers are going to come, and they're going to eat it away. Now, we have those special people in trucks that will drive by and pick them up, you know, <laughs> get them out of the way. But if a deer dies in the forest, it, you are not going to find a fossil. Yeah, it's actually a very special process to get a fossil. You know, and a lot of times what happens is the animal has to die quickly and it cannot be accessed by other animals. Okay, so quicksand or a landslide or a flood, uh, all those could be a good way to fossilize creatures pretty quickly. You know where we found fossils? We found fossils on the Alps and Everest. Now, once again, how do you get fossils? It's got to be quick. Other animals can't access it. A flood is actually a very good explanation of that. Okay, animals killed very quickly. Other animals are not going to have a chance to scavenge, so it has that time to... I mean, we have found fossils on the Alps and Everest. What's your conclusion? How do we have water fossils on the highest mountain peaks around the world? Well, a flood makes a whole lot of sense. And remember, it takes special circumstances to make a fossil. An animal doesn't just die and become a fossil. Special things have to happen. You have to die quickly. You have to be preserved. No other animals can be accessed to you. How did the Bible write about dinosaurs? How did the Bible know to write about a flood? You know, I, it's because God knows what's going on. Like I said, it just gets, it, it's just amazing. In Numbers chapter 19, it talks about the water purification. You know, they washed their hands, the Jews did. It's interesting when you read historical documents and it talks about the Jews, actually a lot of people viewed the Jews as they were using some crazy uh, uh, just they, they thought they, I mean, for lack of a better term, they almost write them like they were clean freaks, but it was almost like we don't know why the Jews are not getting sick. They thought there was something special about the Jews. Well, what was special about the Jews? Well, one, God taught them how to wash their hands and how to make soap. And you actually see that in Numbers chapter 19. If you read down through there, it's going to have a weird uh, ingredients to make soap, but it talks about hyssop. It talks about the ashes of a heifer, and I'm not an expert, but what they said is they would make this ash, and they would put hyssop in it, and they'd put these other things, and they would take this ash that had hyssop, which is basically has antibacterial type properties. They'd take this ash, and they'd mix it in their water, and they'd wash their hands. Well, in, Romans, uh, in, Numbers, sorry, in Numbers chapter 19, God tells them when to wash their hands. He says, hey, when you touch a dead body, wash your hands. When you touch bodily fluids, blood and such, wash your hands. The Bible tells people there are certain times where you should wash your hands. Not only should you wash your hands, you should wash your hands with water purification. But the water purification, what was it? They made this special ingredient that had hyssop and these things, and they would mix it with water, and they were washing their hands. The Jews didn't get sick too often. Also, the dietary laws probably helped them in Leviticus chapter 11. God tells them a whole bunch of animals not to eat. That probably helped them a lot too because a lot of those animals, if they're not cooked appropriately, can make you very sick and many times kill you. The Jews, God was protecting them. Now the Jews didn't know, hey, God's given us the perfect ingredient to wash our hands. They're just doing what God said. God said, wash your hands, we're going to wash our hands. 
They didn't know why God necessarily restricted these animals. Looking back, we see that those animals are very dangerous to eat. How did they know this? You know, when you start looking in history and you put this stuff in perspective, we didn't really strongly, as like humans collectively, it was like the 1400s before we really started taking hand washing seriously. The 1400s. In fact, there's a story of a doctor that he would run from woman to woman. This was, this was common practice at the time, delivering babies. And they just stick their hands in this woman's fluids and help deliver that baby. They wouldn't wash their hands and they'd run to another woman. And all these women were getting sick and dying and they couldn't figure it out. The Bible said wash your hands a long time ago, especially when you're dealing with uh, bodily fluids and things like that. How did these men know? The real answer is they didn't. They just were writing what God was telling them to write. Once again, we could go on and on and on and on. We just simply don't have the time. Scientific foreknowledge is, is another pillar of Bible inspiration. The people of the Bible were asked, uh, were, they were writing things that they, there was no way of them knowing. In 1860, there was a gentleman. They actually have a statue dedicated to him. He was kind of really sick, and he was reading the Bible. He came to Psalms chapter 8, and verse 8. It talks about pathways in the ocean. And he says, I'm going to find those pathways if I get off this deathbed. Well, he ended up doing that, and he, he's known as the father of currents. That was in 1860. But if you read Psalms chapter 8 and verse 8, it talks about paths in the sea. You know what we have in the oceans? We have currents. I think they just discovered a new one off the coast of uh, Africa recently. Which, I, I mean, there are pathways in the ocean. There are currents. The Bible talked about that a long time ago. Oh, that's just coincidence. That's just coincidence. Well, we can kept, keep moving on. You know, the stars. Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 22, it says the host of heaven cannot be counted. That's not an intuitive idea. If you look up at the, the sky, you might think, I can count the stars. I don't know. Maybe you don't have that thought. But Kepler did, the father of astronomy. He looked up at the stars. He said, oh, there's about a thousand up there. <laughs> there's about a thousand stars up there. You know, if you just Google that question, that's what I put up after it. If you just Google that question, that's what they'll say. Astronomers use math to make an educated guess. That the skies are, and it goes on. Basically, it says, we have no clue how many stars there are. We have no clue. We have no idea. We're probably having trouble with just the stars in our own galaxy. Don't ask us to try to do the stars for the whole universe. Not an intuitive idea. How did these writers just write, hey, the stars can't be counted? Kepler thought he could. He said, there's a thousand out there. Or whatever. I might be misquoting Kepler. Sorry, Kepler. The water cycle. The water cycle. The water cycle wasn't formally written down as something that we understood until 1580. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 7, it says all the rivers run into the sea. And it actually talks about this idea that the rivers run to the sea and then the water will go back to where it came from. What does it mean? It comes back to the sky and then it goes back to the rivers and there's the water cycle. Not formally introduced until 1580. But the Bible's talking about it, this idea. And think about that. I don't know if I woke up and my parents didn't teach me that. I don't know if I would wake up and go, hey, all rivers run to the ocean. Like, that doesn't, like, I don't know if I'd wake up and I'd look at the river and I'd think that. No, I think over a period of time that your parents could teach you that information. But it was a long time before we understood the water cycle, how water worked. In Ecclesiastes, they wrote about it. The dietary laws in Leviticus chapter 11. There's a lot of things on that list that are very unsafe for us to eat. One being bats. Okay. You know, one being bats. I, I got a couple chuckles. You know, bats are a high carrier of rabies and other diseases. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that I'm an expert in all fields, but that is one thing that's on the restriction list. But not only that, there are lizards and salamanders, and these things, when you start looking at them, lizards have a high percentage, a high chance of carrying salmonella. Also, when you start to look at bats, they have a high transfer of rabies to humans. There's a lot of things dangerous about the list in Levit Leviticus chapter 11, a lot of them. And I, I, I'd suggest to you that we don't even understand them all. Fasting is another one that I think people don't think about too often. That's kind of one of the personal ones that I've been studying a lot recently. I've actually preached on fasting before. I think it's an interesting topic that I think that a lot of people shade away from because the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about it. But you know that every major religious figure in the Bible fasted. And I think a lot of people in America have turned their nose up at fasting for quite a long time. I think it's because I think America, we love food. <laughs> to go without food is like a crime in America, you know. Uh, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You know, you can't skip that. You know, all major religious figures in the Bible fasted. And actually, in the last two years in particular, the research has been uh, pouring in a ton on fasting. 
on the health benefits. Now, I think you got to be careful in this. I'm not telling you that you should fast for the health benefits. If you're going to fast, I think you should fast for a Bible reason. And there are Bible reasons out there. But you think about that. In America, people would say, you skip one meal? That's the biggest crime you could do in America. How dare you skip a meal? Well, actually, all major religious figures did that. And actually, the research is starting to pour in that it may be extremely beneficial. If you just Google that question, is fasting beneficial, this is what comes up. Fasting is a practice that has been associated with a wide array of health benefits, including weight loss, improved blood sugar control, heart health, brain function, and cancer prevention. Now, I'm not telling you to fast for the health benefits. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. Is that the Bible is not going to tell you to do something that I think that would be really detrimental. When Jesus fasted, I think people look at Jesus like, Jesus, you're crazy. What are you doing? Abraham, Moses, what are you doing? You're fasting. What are you doing? You're crazy. Actually, it's not hurting them. It's not hurting to go out without food for a period of time. In fact, it's really interesting when you dig into the research, but that's not the point of fasting. But actually, uh, once you go past 24 hours, your body goes into autotrophy, which basically your cells start eating the bad parts of your cells. Question, how do you get cancer? It's when your cells start mutating and they start copying bad copies of your cells. And what you do, actually, is you actually, your cells start turning and they start eating. It's interesting stuff. Like I said, that's not really our purpose. But I'm just trying to tell you that the Bible, when it says something, they're saying it way before their time. The Bible will say things when it's not politically correct. The Bible will say things before they should know it. How in the world did they know that not eating food for a period of time may be beneficial? I don't think they did. I think they just wrote what God told them to write. You know, flat earth, that was one for a period of time. If you go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, it says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. That was a big argument. Like I said, you have to put yourself back here. Back here they believed that there was a flat earth, and then back here they wrote this. Okay? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. So the Bible says here that the circle of the earth... And then here, everyone's believing flat earth, and then now we come to the conclusion that, you know, the world is uh, circular, is round, is sphere. The earth is suspended. Now, like I said, this is hard for us because we've all been taught a lot of these things in school, so we're like, oh, that's not a big deal. But if you put it in its historical context, it is a big deal. You know that people used to contemplate how the world was held up? In fact, uh, I I put up here in the Hindu religion that they believe that there was a turtle... And there's four elephants on that turtle's back, and that's what held the world. You think about that. What holds the world? The Greeks, they had uh, Atlas, and you probably saw the picture. Atlas has got the world on his back, and he's, like, carrying it. And then there was common. It's documented. The common theory was there was four basically kind of strings to the edges of the universe, and these four strings is what held the world. Well, you saw pictures. What holds the world? Nothing. And what does it say in Job, chapter 26 and verse 7? He hangs the earth on nothing. Man, that's an amazing idea. Think about that. Controversial idea, perhaps, to some people. It's like, whoa, 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 I know the earth is held by Atlas. Wait, I know that the earth is this. I know the earth is this. The Bible already wrote what it is, what's there. We we can't go back and change it. In uh, 1882, Herbert uh, Spencer, he was an evolutionist. He thought he made a big discovery, a big discovery. And actually, if you read back in the time, he thought, I mean, everybody thought that this was the biggest thing. But he said there's really, you know, five major things that basically everything in Earth kind of circles around. He said there's time, force, action, space, and matter. And this was a big revelation. I mean, in the papers, everything. This Herbert Spencer, he knows his stuff. You know, if you read Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, I can find all those. In the beginning, time, God, he's the force, he's the initial force, created, that's action, the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. God had all five of those there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Herbert Spencer, you're not as sharp as as people maybe claimed you to be. I mean, it's all there in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Like I said, we could go on for ages, but that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to kind of get us to think that this book that we have before us is amazing. History, that's one pillar of the Bible's inspiration. Geography, that's one pillar of Bible inspiration. Scientific foreknowledge, that's one pillar of Bible inspiration. And the last pillar, I would say, is prophecy. Now, prophecy is very interesting because people, they say things about the Bible, and and I feel like people, a lot of times, they just don't dedicate time to study to it. An atheist doesn't dedicate a whole lot of time to studying the Bible. So a lot of times they'll say things like this. Well, the Bible was changed. That's why all the... No, the Bible wasn't changed. 
The Septuagint was an Egyptian translation of the Old Testament. It was done 200 years before Jesus came on the scene. It's like time stamp, okay? It's like a time stamp. I believe that the Bible, the Old Testament was written way back here, but they made a translation of the Old Testament, just the Old Testament, this, and they, it was called the Septuagint, and they did it 200 years before Jesus came on the scene. So everything that's written, when you look at Isaiah, when you look at all these prophecies, you know, we know with pretty, I mean, certainty, even the biggest skeptics have to say, this was written 200 years. There's no going back and changing. There's no going back and trying to change the script. These were written 200 years before Jesus came on the scene. At least, I would say, sometimes thousands. But at least 200 years, the biggest skeptic has to say. You know, when you start to look at that, there's about 300 prophecies about Jesus. There's a mathematician, uh, I, might, I might mess it up, I'm trying to find my notes, Peter Stone. Peter Stone, he, de- he was a mathematician, he decided to do the calculations on this. He said there's 300 prophecies that were written 200 years before Jesus came on the scene. What statistically is the chance that somebody would fi- fulfill those? What's the statistical chance that there's this book written 200 years before Jesus comes on the scene that someone would fill those? Well, he had trouble with that. Because he said if someone just fulfilled eight of the 300 prophecies, he said it would be impossible. So that means when we look at these 300 prophecies that were written 200 years before Jesus came, we just need Jesus to match up with eight. And if he matches up with eight, they're saying that's impossible. This would be like a miracle. This is unbelievable. And yet people will turn their nose up at prophecies all the time. But we just need eight of them. I don't even need all 300, but there are 300. There are 300 prophecies about all kinds of things in relation to Jesus. The family that he was going to come from. The birthplace. What was going to happen on trial. I mean, we could go through and through and through and look at so many of these. But there weren't only prophecies about Jesus. There were actually prophecies in other areas, but simply were just running out of time. When you look at the Bible, I suggest you look at it a second time. Take a second look. This book is from God. The history is accurate. The geography is accurate. The scientific foreknowledge is accurate. The prophecies are accurate. And I'll take this book against any other. And I really want you to think about that for a second. And I really want you to think about it when, it talks about, when we're talking about after death. Because you got these two camps, right? Of course, we can make many camps. There's the Bible, and let's say there's the atheist and the agnostic. Okay? What I'm telling you to do is go with the most reliable source. Right? That's what we were taught in school. You know? Go with the most reliable source. The Bible. When it says something about history, is it accurate? Yes. When the Bible says something about geography, is it accurate? Yes. When the Bible says something about uh, scientific foreknowledge, is it accurate? Yes. When the Bible makes a prophecy, is it accurate? Yes. The Bible is very reliable. Now I want to go over to the other camp. I want to go to the atheist agnostic camp. I hate to tell you, but the atheist agnostic, they've changed their story a hundred times. How old was the world yesterday? It's probably changed. Right? A few years ago, they said the world was millions of years old. We're confident it's a million years old. Now it's 500 million. Now it's a billion. They have changed their story over and over again. Something else I'll tell you about the atheist agnostic is they have lied over and over again. And I don't have time to go into it, but there are a lot of lies that they have just laid out in documented form. Well, let's just discuss one really quickly. Embryology. Embryology is used to support evolution sometimes. It's the idea that all embryos look the same. Do you know how embryology started? A guy got in his office, and he drew a picture of a human embryo. He drew a picture of a a toad embryo. He drew a picture of a monkey embryo. By hand! It was a lie. Embryology is a lie. That all embryos look the same is a lie, but yet it's put up there. Oh, yeah, this is support for evolution. It's a lie. The guy sat in his office and he drew the pictures. And yet it's still in some college biology textbooks today. I've got two camps. I've got the Bible that is reliable, consistent, and has not changed. I have this camp over here. They lie. Not only they lie, they change. They change almost daily. Question, when someone's going to advise me about the afterlife, who do you think I'm going to go to? The liar inconsistent or the one that's consistent? I can't tell you that I can prove, you know, like using the scientific method, what's going to happen after life. 
but I can tell you who I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with a more reliable source. It's kind of like if I had stu two students run up to me in the classroom. One student's not reliable, the other student is reliable, and one student goes, hey, there's an elephant outside. That's the reliable student. And the other student that's not reliable says, no, there's no elephant outside. Who are you going to believe? Well, I believe the reliable student. The reliable student goes, hey, there's a circus outside. There's an elephant, you know. Who are you going to believe? I'm going to believe the more reliable source. I'm going to put my life on the inspired word of God. It has proved itself over and over and over again. When it comes to worship, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to any subject, I want to turn to the book and see what it has to say. Perhaps you haven't done those things which the Bible wants you to do, the Bible asks you to do what God has asked you to do. This is an opportunity. An opportunity to come forward. If you've walked away from that straight and narrow path and get, receive the prayers of the church, we'll help you in any way we can. Or perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian, do those things which God has asked us to do. For your subject, the Lord's invitation, we ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.